It's been a long year, hasn't it? We've struggled, we've hurt, we've grieved, we've hoped, we've prayed, we've waited. Once again, Easter reminds us that we do not hope, pray, or wait in vain, for we know in whom we all find our rescue.
home here in the power of Christ I'll stand here in the power of Christ we stand well happy Easter to each and every one of you as we gather together online for worship today. And I want to begin by just thanking of all, of all of our musicians and also our technical support staff that helps us to create these online services, just to thank them. And I also want to thank you for being here this day in worship as we worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Today, of course, I want to take a look at, well, at the Easter story and what that was like and what's its significance, its importance for you and me in our lives. And a little later on, Pastor Lynn is going to be giving us, uh, giving us some details about April events that are going to be coming up. I also wanted just to mention that today we are going to be doing communion since this is the first Sunday of the month. And if you want to do communion online, you need to prepare your elements for the communion that's going to happen a little later on in this service. But right now, let's bow our heads and pray together. We praise you, Lord. We give you thanks for your glory, for your greatness, for your goodness, and how you were raised from the dead in order to open to us the door of eternal life. Help us this day to praise you, to lift up our eyes to you, and our spirits be lifted up to you. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In this time of desperation when All we know is doubt and There is only one foundation We believe We believe In this broken generation When all is dark you help us see There is only one salvation we believe, we believe, we believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life, we believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection and he's coming back again. We believe. So let our faith be more than anthem, greater than the songs we and temptation we believe we believe we believe in God the Father we believe in Jesus Christ we believe in the Holy Spirit and he's given us new life we believe in the crucifixion we believe that he conquered death
No one caught in sin remain inside the light of inward shame but fix our eyes upon the cross and run to him who shown great love and bless for us freely you bless for us Christ is risen from the dead trampling over death by death Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead. We are one with him again. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Beneath the weight of all our sin. Bow to not but heaven's will, no scheme of hell, no scoffers cry, no burden great can hold you down and stray. You reign for heaven at your church. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with him again. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Stand in the light. The glory of God has defeated the night. Oh, yeah. Where is your sting? And oh, hell. Where is your victory? Oh, church, come stand in the light. Our God is not dead. Risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead. We are one with him again. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. these words from Luke chapter 24 verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, 
Suddenly, two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen clothes by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, again, happy Easter to everyone as we continue on in this sermon series on the stories of Jesus. Uh, and as I was getting prepared for this particular sermon, I was reminded of something. Uh, as I was watching the, uh, you know, the Elite Eight basketball, maybe some of you are watching the NCAA basketball tournament now, and has Baylor advanced along with several other teams to the Final Four, which is going to be happening uh, this weekend and into Monday and what have you. Uh, and I was reminded of a guy who was a coach not only at Baylor, but also a coach at OU, the guy by the name of Dave Bliss, and Dave Bliss, when he was at OU, and this was back in the day when the Big 12 Conference was, that, at that point, actually the Big 8 Conference, and Chuck Ninus was the commissioner of the Big 8 Conference, uh, and uh, he, oh, Dave Bliss took his OU basketball team up to Missouri, up to Columbia, and they were going to play the University of Missouri, uh, and they got there, and then uh, the day before and the night before, uh, man, it just like a huge so snowstorm came in and it just, just dumped a tremendous amount of snow, so much snow that the referees who were going to ref the game uh, the next night, they weren't able to get in there. And so the University of Missouri's athletic director called up Chuck Ninus, the director, uh, commissioner of the Big Eight, and they kind of negotiated around, well, it would be okay for us to take some guys that were in intramural and small college uh, referees here just in this local Columbia area and use them instead. And and uh, Ninus says, okay, but let me check with Bliss. And so he calls Bliss, and Bliss says, yeah, that'd be okay. We can play the game that way. And so the next evening, they get to the game, and the game starts, and he's watching. Bliss is there at the sidelines, and he's watching his team play, and he's watching. Every time that they came down, well, there would be calls, fouls that would be called on the OU players. And then on the other end, the same thing would happen, but they wouldn't be called on the Missouri players. And this went on for a while. And so finally, Bliss, he got up and he started yelling and screaming at the rest, call it evil, equal, call it right, you know, and what have you. And finally, one of these rest, who was one of these local guys, as he was running down the court, he looked at Bliss and he yelled back at him, sit down and shut up, coach. You're just mad because we're winning. Now, I would define that as a hopeless situation, and that's what exactly how Dave Bliss took it. He said he, at that point, he, he just sat down and he shut up because... There was nothing that was going to do, it was going to happen. I mean, that was just the way that game was going to go, and they were going to lose. Well, you know, I think that also defines, in a certain sense, the situation of the followers of Jesus on Good Friday and on Holy Saturday and coming into Easter morning. Uh, they had just gotten into what they considered to be a hopeless situation. Jesus was in the tomb. Uh, they had put him in the tomb there uh, on Friday after he had been executed as a criminal on the cross uh, and unjustly so, and, and it says that uh, they put him in this tomb in this local private cemetery, uh, and uh, they kind of wrap the body, and they leave him in there, and they're going to have to wait until after the Sabbath in order to prepare the body for final burial. 
Uh, and so nobody is expecting to find Jesus alive. Uh, they think, you know, it's kind of all over. They had been following Jesus for, you know, someone for two and a half, three years. Uh, they had thought that he was the Messiah. They thought that he was the one that was going to bring the kingdom of God to Israel. Uh, and they thought that finally God was going to save his people. Uh, and they knew that, well, he couldn't have been the Messiah because he was executed and he's dead now. And so, well, they didn't believe. They just figured, you know, dead people stay dead. And none of them, nobody believed at that point. There were no Christians. There were no believers in Jesus because nobody expected Jesus to be found alive. And so it says early in the morning uh, of uh, that first Easter, the women, uh, they got together and they got some spices together and they were going to go down to the tomb and they were going to prepare the body of Jesus for its final burial. Uh, and so they head out for the tomb at before the daybreak and they get down there and something happens which changes the world, literally changes history. You look at it, there you'll see that passage on, the, on your screens. But on that first day of the week, at early, at early dawn, they, that is the women, came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they didn't find the body. And while they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. Okay, and it says that the women were terrified and bowed to their, fa their faces to the ground because they, they believed, well, these must be angels of God. And, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. And then, he, then these guys said this to them, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners, be crucified, and on the third day rise from again from the dead. And then it says these women, they remembered Jesus' words. Because they were there and they were looking for the dead because they assumed that the dead was going to, were going to be dead. And, and Jesus, guess what? Jesus is not there because it says these guys, these angels, these messengers of God, he's alive. He's been risen. Uh, and so they try and remember what he said to, the, to you guys, you know, about what was supposed to happen. And, and these people, these women and men that were with Jesus, they couldn't accept it. They couldn't believe it because you know, they just couldn't see how it would happen. Or, or sometimes we just, you know, there are things we just don't want to hear. And now God opens their hearts and minds. And it says to these women, oh, they remember, that's, that is what Jesus said was going to happen. And they understand it. And so uh, after this, this happens, it says they take off for where the apostles are. And you'll see this next quote. And they told all this to the 11, the 11 apostles that were remaining. And to all the rest, now, now that it was Mary Magdalene, and it was Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. And this is the apostles' reactions. But these words seemed to them, that is the apostles, an idle tale. And they did not believe them because the apostles didn't believe. I mean, you know, uh, they didn't believe Jesus was alive. Uh, there was none of the apostles that hung around there outside the tomb saying, well, you know, about three days he's going to come back to life and we better be there. And they didn't believe that. You know, he's like, well, the, the, he's dead. Uh, you know, he was with us for a time. He did these marvelous things. He taught us such incredible things. We thought he was the Messiah. And then he's got executed. And so all this investment that we had in him as we, we left our businesses and we left our homes and we followed him for all of that time, then, you know, it's just all over. And it must have been just kind of a waste. And so now we've got to kind of re, we've got to pick up our lives. And so... They were just had this kind of block, this resistance to these, what these women were saying, and understandably so. And so it says they just, it seemed like idle tales. It seemed like just, you know, some kind of something that somebody made up or something or other. Again, they wouldn't believe. But now Peter, you'll see this next quote. It says, Peter, he's kind of one of those guys that he's, uh, he's kind of a show me kind of guy. And so it says, but Peter got up and he ran to the tomb and he stooped in and looking in, he saw, well, there's the linen clothes, all right, by themselves, kind of over in the corner. And the body of Jesus is not there. The linen's still there. Uh, and so he went home amazed at what had happened. He's kind of like, I, I can't quite figure this out. You know, I, I see these things. But it couldn't be what the, these women were telling us had happened. Uh, and so, you know, I'm just kind of trying to figure this out. It just is kind of stunning. Well, later that day, Peter finds out what's really happened. Because it comes to him. 
the reality of what has happened comes to him. You'll see there in this next quote. And they found, the 11, now this, these, these are the guys that were in Emmaus, and they, they, they see the risen Lord, and then they charge back to Jerusalem, uh, and they find the 11 apostles and their companions gathered together, and they say to them, uh, they say to these guys who are, from, they are coming back from Emmaus, these apostles and companions, they say to them, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Peter. In other words, what we thought we couldn't even dream of, it was beyond anything we would expect, that, that the power of God to do such things in the presence in our lives, that it actually has happened, and that he has been raised from the dead. And uh, all of a sudden, man, all of a sudden, hopelessness changes to hope, and despair and grief changes to joy, because what's happened is that a new creation literally has been born, because Jesus has been raised from the dead. And it changed their lives, and it changed the world. And it continues to change the world this day. Now, I just wanted to ask for a few minutes here, so what's the significance of Easter for us? Uh, and I just wanted to lift up a few things about how, that, how Easter affects us on a, in a real way. Uh, and the first thing is just simply lift this up. I can leave, because of Easter, I can leave the past to the mercy of God. I can leave the past to the mercy of God. You know, there's an interesting passage from Romans 6, uh, and sometimes you hear it, uh, hear it uh, spoken, and you know, people kind of cringe when they hear this particular little phrase, uh, and where Paul writes this, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Now, what is, what is that all about? You know, as I was thinking about that this week, uh, I was reminded of... Uh, a couple of things that happened to me. One was, I was reminded of a guy by the name of Bob Barrett. We called him BB, and BB was the manager of the Phillips 66 station over on the Turner Turnpike that I worked at there at Wellston when I was uh, going into college and, and through most of college. Uh, and uh, he would, and I would be on one on a shift, and sometimes this would happen. Uh, he'd be there, and I'd be working with him, uh, and he would get his paycheck. Uh, and this was back in the day when they didn't direct deposit at that point, so he'd get an actual physical paycheck and with a stub on it. Uh, and I'd go in there once in a while, and he'd have that paycheck. He got it from the mail that particular day, and he'd be bouncing that paycheck on the desk, and he would look at it, and he would bounce it on the desk a little bit, and he'd say, I, I just can't believe that's right. I just can't believe that's all. Because maybe he'd, he'd work some some overtime or something else had happened or there was supposed to have been a bonus he was supposed to get or something like that. I just can't believe that that could be right. And he'd look at that thing and he'd just be disgusted. These, this is my, these are my wages? And then he'd say, Michael, he'd say, you, you're going through that physics program at OSU. Why don't you figure out, is this right? And see, give it to me. And, and I would sit there and I would calculate it out and I would say, yeah, Bob, that's, that's actually your wages. Oh, that can't be. Well, Paul says the wages, we have an employer, and that employer is called brokenness or sin, and it pays a wage, and it's wage that it pays is death. Now, to get at what that means, let me tell you something that happened 15 feet from that spot where he was bouncing that check, but about three years earlier. So it's summer... And I'm on this, on the turnpike there, I'm working, and this assistant manager's there, and then there's this other guy, and me, and we're working, and, and we walk up towards where this, where this office is, and as we're walking up towards this office area, there are these two uh, black guys, these two African-American guys, they, they pull in to the drive, and they kind of circle in, and they park uh, just kind of off to the side of where we're at, and this, uh, jump out, and one guy goes in, and he, he jumps out, and he's going into the bathroom there, in the station. Great. And so we walk up by him, and we stop right there, and this assistant manager, he looks at the car, and he starts making racist comments, one right after another. Inward this, inward that, inward this. And every time he's seeing that, I just, it just pains me. And he looks at me and says, what's the matter? Don't you like that? And I said, no, not, not really. Inward this, inward that. And so this guy, he comes out, of the restroom area, he comes out and he gets into the car and what this manager, assistant manager didn't know was that, hey, there's another guy that's in their car. Now, wouldn't you, would you be interested to know 
I wonder what it would have been like, those, the conversation between, between those two black men about what had been going on outside that car. And all of a sudden, he fires, this guy fires it up, and he backs that real fast, and he spins, he, he burns rubber, he's burning rubber all the way through the service station area as he's headed out back to get on the turnpike. That's the wages of sin. It's death. Death of relationships. Death of connection with God. Death of connection with other people. Now, who would want to work for an employer like that? Well, Paul, uh, a lot of times what happens is people will quote that first part, but they don't quote the rest of the sentence because this is where things change because Paul says the wages of sin is death, but, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And they say, yes, you can be a slave to that kind of stuff, and you can die in that kind of stuff, or you can accept the free gift of God. And the free gift of, of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, an eternal life that begins with abundant life now and leads into eternal life with Him because He has opened the door to eternal life through His resurrection. And you see, the reality is, you know, we can't go back and change the past, and we can't go back in time, redo things, so God says, I'll heal your past and I'll give you a new future. Because I don't want you stuck in that kind of brokenness. That's the power of Easter. Now there's a second part to the power of Easter. I can leave the present to the love of God. I can leave the present to the love of God. Now, now love, I should say that in, the, in Greek there are just a few words that relate to what love is. Uh, and what is... Uh, Phileo, which means uh, a mutual love. It's like, you know, I love you and do this for you, and you love me and you do that for me, and we've got this kind of mutual thing going on between us. That's not what he's talking about. That's, what not, that's not what the Scripture is talking about when he talks about the love of God or the love of Jesus. And then there's eros, which is another form of love in the Greek, and that's erotic love. That's not what the Scripture is talking about. And there's another kind. There are other kinds of love. I, there's one kind of love. Is kind of, I guess I would call it uh, sticky love. Uh, and that is where people are so fused together that they think the fusion is love. And in the process, they lose their selves. Now, this is the kind of love that is present in our lives through the, because of the Easter resurrection. And this is love, not that we love God, says John, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also should love one another in that way too. Now, okay, so that was Jesus' love on the cross. Does it still extend to me today and to the struggles that I'm going through today? And the answer to the Bible is definitely, definitely yes. Uh, and you'll see these, this next quote here. Jesus Christ he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is to say, he loved you yesterday he loves you with that same sacrificial love and, and giving love today, and he will love you that way forever. There's nothing that's going to change that. And because that's true today, what you can do, there's one example, what you can do is you can cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you, because his love is there for you this day. And so you don't have to walk through these worries and anxieties and fears and concerns by yourself. Instead, you can give them to him and let him bear them. And let him strengthen you. I leave the past to the mercy of God. I leave the present to the love of God that's here with me today in Jesus. And then I leave the future to the providential care of God. To the care of God. You know, as I was thinking about that this week, I was reminded of something that I saw uh, a few years back in Costa Rica. I was on a mission trip down to Costa Rica. Uh, and we were building some houses down there for some folks who had been wiped out by a flood. Uh, and uh, one day we were driving up a mountain and we pulled into this little little uh, wayside place and, and we got in there and we got some, some hot, hot chocolate and some, some bread, some local bread that they made and we were sitting there and we looked down and down below it there was this field and in this field there were these two kind of these huge oxen and they were yoked together uh, and there was this guy that was leading these oxen around this field, driving these oxen around this field as he was using these oxen to plow this thing. Now, the oxen, they were strong. They were, they were able uh, you know, to do this thing, but it's only the human that knew the path. 
It was only the human that knew what needed to get done. And God offers that kind of guidance with us in our lives too. In other words, that he gives us a plan. He has a plan for us. And if we do that plan, it has great benefits for us. You'll see there from Ephesians 2. God has made us what we are in Christ. God made us to do good works, which he planned in advance. He's already got it planned. He was, he was planned before you were born for us to live our lives doing. In other words, there's a plan that's already in place for how he can see you moving forward and his providential care is trying to lead you in that direction. Now, let's give me, I want to give you an example of what the plan looks like. And you see there the plan, and it's well, where Jesus says this. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find what? Rest for your souls. Rest for your souls. And when he says yoke, what he's literally talking about, what that would have been uh, talking about in the first century would have been, uh, take my yoke upon you would be where a rabbi is saying, you know, listen to my teachings, follow my teachings, follow my leadings, my direction. And so really to take my yoke upon you is an invitation to obey his way and his plan that he lays out for us. And he says the consequence of that is that you'll find rest for your souls in a, in a world that a lot of times where we just feel driven and we feel put upon and we feel kind of, we feel kind of run down, that no, we'll find rest for our souls. Now let me give you some examples of how that looks. His teachings. Okay, so that's what Jesus is saying when he says there in Matthew 7 in the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Whoever hears these words of mine and acts on them, he will be like a wise person who has built his house on rock. He says, okay, I've got to listen to his teachings. Now, that would mean that I would have to, I would have to read and study the Scripture. I would have to read and study the Gospels. And I would have to read and study what his apostles say about what his teachings were. There is a second thing in that yoke. His example. Uh, as Paul says, be imitators of me as what? As I am an imitator of Jesus Christ. In other words, that, that ultimately our goal is to be an imitator of Jesus. Now, that, you know, we say, well, I can't do any miracles. Oh, okay, well, you know, uh, I can't walk on water. Well, uh, you know, I understand that. I, I, you know, all of us would probably sink on that one. Uh, but there's some things that Jesus did in his life that were the foundation of his life where he got his power to do that life that certainly we could do. Like the times that he would take time out in silence and in solitude in order to be in communion with his heavenly father. And that was one of the things that says that he did frequently. If you go back and you read the uh, gospels, it's like, he's like, Jesus is out there. He's doing that all the time. Uh, you know, oh, people are wanting this and people want that. Oh, okay, I hear you that. I hear that. I understand that. I got to take some time. I'll, I'll see you in a bit. He would go out and he would go up to the side of a mountain. He would pray or he would get up before dawn and he would go out and pray or he would go to some place and he would, he would take time and he would lead his disciples to do the same thing. We may not do miracles, but we can imitate the way that he lived his life. The second thing, and the third thing, should I say, is his spirit. And you'll see that quote from Romans 5, the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. In other words, that that. It's not simply that I need his teachings if I'm going to have that yoke, and I need his example if I'm going to have that yoke. I've got to have the power to do that, and that's where it comes from in the Holy Spirit, in his spirit being given to me, in the spirit that has been poured into our hearts. And that is the same spirit, just to tell you how much power we're talking about, that is the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that dwells, says Paul, in you. I need his teachings, I need his example, and I need his spirit as part of this plan. And there's a fourth thing that I need. I need who the risen Lord is for me. Who he is for me. Look at these quotes. Just to think about the, the importance of that for a person's life. The son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is to say, he sacrificed his life for you. Out of love for you. Or that a quote from Revelation 3. Where Jesus says this, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I say, I, he says, I have set before you a door. And if you walk through that door, on the other side of the door is abundant life and eternal life. And no one and no thing is able to shut that. The door is open. That opportunity is there for you. It's open, that opportunity is there every day of your life. 
And then he, Paul puts it this way, and he says, in him, every one of God's promises is yes, yes. When we see him raised, that means that God speaks to us and says, yes, these promises are for you. He's speaking yes over your life. That's who he is for you and me. So, in conclusion, I just wanted to ask some questions here. What in the past, you might want to ask yourself, what in the past do I need to turn over to the mercy of God? Because Good Friday and Easter have opened the door of forgiveness. And what in the present do I need to trust to the love of God for me? Because it didn't, his love didn't simply end on Good Friday, it continues today. And then how will I live into the providential care of God for my future? That is to say that he is guiding me. If I will take his joke, he will guide me not only in time but in eternity into the kind of life and abundant life and eternal life that he wants for you and me. To have that kind of connection with God, that's the power of Easter for you. Let's pray together. We praise you, Lord, for your great goodness and for your ability to, to strip away the power of death and to open to us the door of eternal life. And not only eternal life, but abundant life now. Help us to say yes to your yoke. Help us to say yes to life so that we can follow you and we can be blessed. For we ask these things in your name. Amen. So as I said earlier, on the first Sunday of the month, on this Easter Sunday, we are going to be doing communion. And if you're going to partake online, I want to invite you to now assemble your elements uh, so that you can get ready for communion that we're going to have in just a second. So we're going to give you just a moment to do that. So now that uh, you've assembled your elements uh, there, that those of you who are going to be uh, partaking at home, I want to invite you to bow your heads and let's pray this prayer of consecration. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your goodness and grace that is always upon us, how you made all that is created and that you gave us life. And we, we see in the, in the newness of spring the evidence of that, that uh, power of life that you have that's all around us. We give you thanks that when we separated from you and our love failed, your love remained steadfast and you sent your prophets and lawgivers to teach us and to guide us into what is the truth. And in the fullness of time, you sent your only begotten son to be among us as the way, the truth, and the life. You remember how on the night in which he was betrayed, as he gathered there in the upper room with his disciples, he took the bread, he broke it, he gave it to them after he had prayed over it and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after the supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us, or wherever we might be this day, as we prepare to receive communion. And upon these elements that we have before us, make them be for us the body and blood of Jesus, that we may be for the world the body of Jesus cleansed and raised and strengthened by His blood. By Your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at His heavenly banquet. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now I want to invite you to go ahead and receive communion.
Now that we've received, I want to invite you to uh, pray this prayer of communion after communion with me. You'll see it there on your screen. You have given yourself to us, Lord. Now we give ourselves to others. You are our help and strength. Through your resurrection, we have become a people of hope. Amen. As children of God, our offerings are an important part of our worship of God, and there are several ways that you can give your offerings to support God's work in the world through Good Shepherd's General Fund. You can send a check to the church at 10928 Southwest 15th in Yukon, Oklahoma, zip 73099. You can also go online to Good Shepherd's website at umcgs.org. Scroll down the page and click the Give button. You'll be sent to Good Shepherd's Giving Portal, operated by Shelby Next Giving. Easter meals. Good Shepherd is such a generous church. Last weekend, Good Shepherd provided 154 persons in our community who were in need. We provided food for a family, a big Easter meal, and more. Thanks to all who helped organize this mission and deliver the meals. Thanks to everyone who contributed food and funds to make this mission possible. Sunday, April 11th is Children's Sunday. You won't want to miss it. We look forward to the Good Shepherd's children helping with worship next week as we continue in the Stories of Jesus series. Thank you for being here in worship this Easter. Share this worship service with someone. And if you or someone you know is interested in attending an in-person worship at Good Shepherd, we have in-person services every Sunday at our campus on Southwest 15th Street. Receive this benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. Amen. I know, I know he's rescued my soul. His blood has covered my sin. Together, wherever you might be. I know. I know he's rescued my soul. His blood has covered my sin.
Come on, guys. Bring some.